discourse is in one sense a story is about the world, but stories is kind of not strong enough as a term because stories implies something we make up. It implies something in contrast to the facts and the truth which is out there. And discourses um, is stronger because it is the stories that not just we make up, but that make us up. Um, it is the truth about the world, not because it describes some world, but because it produces the world. Um, but to coin Valley Walkerdyne's much used phrase, they are fictions functioning in truth. Uh, a phrase from Michel Foucault, they are practices systematically formed the objects of which they speak. And practices there means language, but it also means what we can hear, what we can see, what we can smell, what we can touch, what we can taste, what we can feel, what we can think, and what we can be. Uh, one of the most interesting examples from the work of Foucault is um, when he says that homosexuals did not exist before that term existed, um, and the kind of constellation of meanings, a constellation of discourses which give that term a meaning. So he's saying that you can look at men who had sex with men in ancient Greece and say they're homosexual, but there's a kind of denial in there of the kind of the different discourses that circulated around that act in those days, the different um, possibilities for identification around that. Um, so coming from homosexuality to maths again, I've got a bit of data from uh, some work that I did in uh, the Sixth Form College. And this is just a sign that was sitting on the notice board in the foyer between the classrooms. So it's where students would wait to before they went into class. They had ample opportunities to read it. So it says, maths is hard. Independent research shows that mathematics is the most challenging subject at A-level. Nationally, last year's AS results in maths were far worse than any other subject. You don't really enjoy maths. If you're not genuinely good at it, don't do it. Two years of struggling, constantly being stuck, is not an experience we can wish on anyone. Success at A-level mathematics usually depends on positive attitudes. Do you enjoy solving problems? Do you like maths? Persistence. Do you give up easily and ask for help? Or do you prefer to get the answer for yourself? Independence. Do you need spoon feeding every step of the way? Can you learn it by yourself? Now, I'm not going to try and do a discourse analysis on the whole thing. I'm just going to pick the first line, the headline, massive heart. What makes it possible to say that? And I just, when I was thinking about this on Saturday, I was thinking there are two streams that my brain went down there. Um, one is, well, it relies on this idea that there are hard and easy subjects, clearly. Um, there's an implied opposite to the hard subjects. Um, the idea of subjects relies on this discourse that you can separate knowledge into subjects. Uh, these are relatively stable. It doesn't actually matter that much that the maths we do today doesn't have the Euclidean geometry that my mum learnt, and it has a load of problems in statistics that she didn't learn. Maths is still there and it's still hard. So it kind of puts a boundary around that. Um, <coughs> and then you've got these boundary subjects that can be arranged in a hierarchy, from the hard to the easy, presumably. Um, and this links to all sorts of ideas about value. But what is the hardest? What is the best? What's the purest? What's the most rational? Which then have implications for, for those people who do those subjects. Um, and there's all sorts of constellations of discourse circulating around each of those terms, rational, pure, best, hard. So thinking about discourses of hardness, well, there's slippages in there into discourses around masculinity and sexuality. Um, there's also the unspoken opposites of hard. The most obvious one is easy, but it's also hard versus soft, hard versus yielded. And all of those, again, have connotations with gender and sexuality. And this is a very fast and furious for kind of romp through discourse analysis. <laughs> um, but I'm just trying to give you a kind of hint of what kind of imperative is when you look at things from this point of view. And what you're really asking is what makes something possible? Um, and here you can, you can look at what makes a lot of things possible. You can look at what makes examinations possible setting viability, specialist scores, gifted and talented, compulsory maths, tiered assessment, the A star grade. The A star grade, when I wrote up the down, I hadn't ever noticed, why don't we go from A to H? What work does that star do? Last week, uh, um, I was having a discussion about gifted and talented, <coughs> and you know, what subjects fall in with, with giftedness? What subjects fall in with talented? What kinds of learners can be read as gifted and what can be learned, read as talented? Which kind of learners can, are able to themselves within which label. Um, so then you would go on in this context, I think, if you're doing discourse perspective, to ask about how do discourses of maths play in these relations? And then taking it on to identity, 
what positions are possible for learners and teachers to take up within these discourses? So I'm an organised trainer. There's a game you can play these training cards, like Top Trumps. <laughs> <laughs> Argue about who's spent the greatest on organised or Anthony Giddens. Um, <laughs> right, so discourse and identity. What you first of all do is you ask, well, what we normally do is we ask, why do people engage in specific practices? We say, why does someone say not do their maths homework? So what discourse first of all does is switch that question around. It says, how does specific practice big people? So what are the practices around school maths and around assessment in schools that um, construct and create this person as someone who does not do that homework? And then what you do is you keep both questions going on in the cat. It's the kind of structure agency thing that Dylan was talking about. And I think the thing which for me discourse does, I suppose, best than socioculture, which is perhaps why I'm there rather than here rather than there, is the power thing and the way it understands um, the relationship between structure and agency through a notion of power. It's a notion of power which is very fluid. Um, Michelle Foucault writes, power is not something that is acquired, seized or shared. Something one holds on to or allows to slip away. Power is exercised from innumerable points and the interplay of non egalitarian and mobile relations. Power is in the relationships that exist in workplaces, families, and schools. And major dominations of hegemonic, hegemonic, hegemonic effects are sustained by all those confrontations. So he's not saying that certain groups don't have power over other groups, but he's saying that we have to do it to understand that. So look at those micro interactions. Look at the way that power flows through the different constellations of discourses. So that power and knowledge aren't interchangeable. But wherever there is power, there is knowledge. Wherever there is knowledge, there is power. And for the analyst, what you have to do is to look at those relationships and to dissect them, to understand them. And Valerie Walker-Dome writes in response to this idea of power, I've always found this idea of Foucault very important, because it presupposes not an ideology voiced upon and separate from subjects, but perhaps a discipline and regulation, which are at the same time practices for the formation of subjects. So what's being said there is that how um, power is in the person. It's a very hard thing to describe, but what it means is that the very way that we become intelligible as a human being, the very moment that we enter into being, we become part of discourse. We have no choice to be, but to be part of discourse, and that moves all the time when we're constantly moving in and out of discourses. So discourses are amazingly productive. They are the ways that we be at all. But they're also constraining because as soon as you take our position in discourse, you have, um, it limits your possibilities for what you can be and what you can think. Um, and this is the double edgedness of power, and this is a quote from Michel Foucault, which I never get bored of, which is, if power were never anything but repressive, if it never did anything but to say no, do you really think one would be brought to obey it? What makes power hold good, what makes it accepted, is simply the fact it doesn't only most and force it says no, but traverses and produces things. It induces pleasure, false knowledge, produces discourse. It needs to be considered as a productive network which runs through the whole social body, much more as a negative incident to these functions of oppression. And this is where desire kicks in, which I think we're going to hear a lot about desire and law and domestic presentation. I'm just going to read this bit of data, which is in, um, some observation notes from um, the same Sixth College, and I was doing observations that the sign came from. And just what, while I'm reading it, I just want you to think about it from the point of view of discourse. So thinking about what discourse can play. How are people being positioned in different places and where's the power flows? Yes, it's referred to as teacher, as naturally able, and it's clearly marked out as different. He is sometimes given different work to do and on one occasion is asked to teach the class his method for tackling quadratic inequalities. At first he tries to explain his solution verbally, but this proves difficult, so he suggests, shall I write it? Mrs. Sawyer, the class teacher, responds, please do. When Yesa writes up his solution, there are many looks from students that combine amusement and amusement. Imran declares, that is so complicated, I've never seen that in my life. Next to AJ, to him, AJ has his hand up. It's like a, a really hand up like that. So, while Saeed says to his teacher, he's clever, isn't he? Then adding, he should do further maths. She agrees with him, he should, but he's busy doing other things. Saeed asks her, why don't you encourage him to do further maths? She responds, I've tried, it's his choice. Yesa has now completed writing up not just his original solution, but also the graph that Mrs. Sire asked him to do at his first approach appears obscure. AJ asks, what is that? And then repeats the question. Suddenly he has his, a thorough graph in his hand up. Then Mrs. Sawyer steps in and goes up to Paul to explain the graphical method, while leaving out Yes's work because it's worthy of honour. She further suggests that you can make sense of his diagram by putting numbers in, 
but you've done it theoretically like a good theoretician.